Apple's new 24-inch iMac has received rave reviews. But how does the new high-end M1 iMac compare to the previous-gen high-end Intel iMac? Is the new iMac that much faster than the old iMac? Let's get into it. I have seen many comparisons of the performance of the M1 iMac to the larger 27-inch iMac or to the iMac Pro. But what about the product that it's actually replacing, the 21.5-inch iMac? As an enthusiast, I wanted to know how the highest-end M1 iMac compared to the highest-end Intel-based iMac. That would give an indication of the performance improvement from last gen to this gen and show us how much more performance you're getting for the money. By the way, the previous-gen Intel-based 4K iMac I'm comparing to today can be purchased at Apple's refurb store for just $1,439. Let's compare the specs. The new M1 iMac base price is $1,499, while the previous-gen high-end Intel-based iMac with the i7 as a build-to-order item was $1,699. The new M1 CPU has 8 total cores with 4 performance cores and 4 efficiency cores. The performance cores run at 3.2 GHz, while the efficiency cores run at 2 GHz. In the Intel-based iMac, the i7 has 6 cores that are hyper-threaded to give it a total of 12 threads. It will run one core up to 4.6 GHz and all core turbo to at least 3.2 GHz. The M1 integrated GPU has eight cores, while the last gen Intel based iMac uses AMD's Radeon Pro 560X with 4 GB of VRAM. For RAM, the M1 uses 8 GB of low profile DDR4X at 4267 MHz, while the last gen iMac has 8 GB of DDR4 at 2666 MHz. Both machines have 256 gigabytes of SSD storage. The new iMac has a 4.5K display panel, while the previous one was a 4K display panel. The default resolution is higher at 2240 by 1260, while the previous gen was 2048 by 1152 resolution. The new iMac now includes a 1080p webcam like the 27 inch iMac received last year, while the previous gen 21 and a half inch iMac still has a 720p webcam. The new iMac also includes upgraded speakers and mic, however, we are going to focus on computing performance in this video. Let's start with the CPU performance. For this, we'll use two programs that are native for the M1 architecture, and that is Geekbench 5 and Cinebench R23. In single core performance using Geekbench 5, you'll see that the M1 scores 1748 compared to the i7's 1,157 for a 51% win. That is a great generational improvement. Looking at the single core performance in Cinebench R23, the M1 scored 1,516, while the i7 scored just 1,180 for a 28% win. Again, a very nice generational improvement. Now let's move on to multi-core performance to see how Apple's eight cores compares to Intel's six cores. In Geekbench 5 Multicore, the M1 scored 7,624, while the i7 scored just 6,218, so the M1 wins by 23%. However, in Cinebench R23 Multicore, the M1 scored 7,760, while the i7 scored 7,371, so the M1 wins again, but by only 5%. Not as convincing of a win, but a win. Now both of these applications have been recompiled for Apple's M1 architecture and show the best performance gains. However, what if the software you use is not optimized for M1? What if the application runs using the Rosetta 2 translation layer? How will the system perform and what kind of performance can you expect? To answer that question, I decided to run benchmark applications that are not M1 native and require running through the Rosetta 2 translation layer. Let's start with Cinebench. And I used all three generations of Cinebench, R15, R20, and R23, so I could go back and compare benchmark numbers to previous processors from a couple of years back. Starting with single core comparisons, in Cinebench R15, the M1 scored 209, while the i7 was just 189. So even in emulation mode, the M1 is 11% faster than the i7. Pretty amazing result. When we look at the Cinebench R20 single core, the results change. The M1 scored just 408, while the i7 scored 468, so the M1 is 13% behind, and it is the first win for the i7. To put that into context, the performance is similar to my first-gen Ryzen Threadripper 1920X that debuted in 2017. 
finally running Cinebench R23 through the Rosetta 2 translator, the M1 scored an even 1000 against the i7's 1180, so the M1 is 15% slower than the i7. Again, the M1 score is similar to my first gen Ryzen Threadripper or any first gen Ryzen running at 4 GHz. Let's move on to Geekbench 4 and Geekbench 5 single core performance. In Geekbench 4, the M1 scored 5,694 against Intel's i7 at 5,884, so the M1 is pretty even at just 3% lower. And in Geekbench 5, the M1 scored 1,340 against the i7 score of 1,157 for a 16% win for the M1. Now let's look at the multi-core performance. In Cinebench R15, the M1 is 10% behind the i7. In Cinebench R20, it's 26% behind the i7. And in R23, it's 30% behind the i7. In Geekbench 4 multi-core, the M1 was 11% lower than the i7, while in Geekbench 5, it was just 4% behind. Moving beyond just Geekbench and Cinebench, I also wanted to check several other render applications to understand the performance comparison. In the Indigo benchmarks, where the measure of performance is in mega samples per second, the M1 was 22% lower than the i7 in both the bedroom and supercar renders. In the Corona benchmark, where the measure of performance is in rays per second, the M1 was 27% lower than the i7. And finally, in the well-known Blender benchmark, the render times were compared. In this chart, high render times equates to slower performance, and in this series of renders, the M1 is slower from 24 to 76%, with many in the 30% range. Now, that was a lot of numbers. Let's see if we can't summarize the CPU performance. To compare the performance, let's chart the relative performance of the M1 to the i7-8700, where the i7 performance is normalized to 100%. Thus, when the bar is greater than 100%, the M1 wins, and when the bar is less than 100%, the i7 wins. Looking at the chart, you can see the M1 wins more than it loses, and this is a testament to the M1's strong single-core performance. However, if we compare the multi-core performance in the same way, we can see that outside of the two native applications at the top, in non-M1 optimized applications, the performance is lower, up to 43% lower than the i7. After all the glowing reviews of the magical M1 chip, the magnitude of the differences was something of a surprise. This demonstrates that if you are using software that has not been compiled for the M1, then you can expect to see a significant reduction in multi-core performance versus the i7. Seeing the performance differences quantified in this manner was an eye-opener. The M1 in this model has 8 GPU cores, while the Radeon Pro 560X has 16 compute units. Now the 560X is based on AMD's Polaris architecture that debuted back in 2016. So how does this new M1 integrated GPU compare against this older architecture in a discrete GPU? In Geekbench 5 Compute, the M1 performance in metal is 1% better, and in OpenCL it is 3% worse. These margins are so small that I would say the performance is equivalent. I then benchmarked both GPUs in both Unigen Heaven and Unigen Valley applications and found that the M1 to be 2% slower in Heaven and 6% faster in Valley. Again, these margins are small and we're looking at similar performance levels. Next was Luxmark, and the M1 wins big in the ball render scene with a 22% advantage and by 17% in the hotel render scene. In Luxmark, the M1 clearly wins against the 560X. Finally, in the GFX Bench Metal Benchmark, using Aztec Ruins at 1080p, the M1 performance is 93% better, and at 1440p, the M1 is 72% better than the 560X. This benchmarking shows that the M1 is clearly superior to the 560X in this metal gaming benchmark. Let's summarize the GPU performance like we did earlier with the CPU performance to get a clearer picture of how well it performs. When the bar is greater than 100%, the M1 GPU wins, and when lower than 100%, the Radeon Pro 560X wins. As you can see in the chart, the M1 GPU is near equivalent to the 560X in most benchmarks, and it vastly outperforms the 560X in the GFX Bench Metal scores. The M1 puts up impressive benchmark scores for an integrated GPU. No other integrated GPU from Intel or AMD provides this level of performance that is equivalent to a discrete graphics card of this caliber. All in all, the new iMac is a capable desktop computer that is a nice upgrade when compared to the previous generation in many ways. However, when we compare the high-end M1 to the high-end i7-8700, the generational improvement is not as clear.
If you purchase the i7, then I assume you care about the performance. Although the M1 does best the i7 CPU in its native applications, it is not as capable of multi-core performance as the i7 when it needs to run applications through the Rosetta 2 translator. To quantify how much the performance is reduced, I ran the M1 in both Geekbench 5 and Cinebench R23, both in native mode and through the Rosetta 2 translator. If we compare the Geekbench 5 single and multi-core scores, the performance drop is about 22%. When we look at the Cinebench R23 single and multi-core scores, we see about a 33% drop in performance. I have been very pleased with the compatibility of every application I've run so far through the Rosetta 2 translator. In this transitionary period away from Intel and to Apple Silicon, it's very impressive how well the applications run. I would rather have the non-native applications run slower than not run at all, and for me, the M1 has been very impressive in that respect. If you did get an i7 in the 21.5 inch iMac and you do run applications that are not yet optimized for M1, then you should wait until that occurs. The multi-core performance of the i7 is still impressive even though Intel debuted that CPU back in October of 2017. Now the integrated GPU in the M1 is very powerful when compared to other integrated GPUs from Intel. The M1 GPU achieves levels of performance of discrete graphics cards from just a few years ago. It's really unprecedented. So let's take a step back and compare the CPU and GPU generational improvements. The performance is clearly better than the i3 or i5 processors from Intel. However, when compared to the i7, it's not as great. It is $200 cheaper than last gen, and that is good. It just seems that since Apple is no longer paying Intel for their expensive CPUs, and that they are no longer paying AMD for their GPUs, then this level of generational upgrade for the first gen Apple Silicon should come at an even better value than the price they are selling in the new iMac. Think about this. You can get the same level of CPU and GPU performance in a Mac Mini that is on sale for $599. So for that same performance, you have to ask yourself the question, what is driving the price of the new iMac? And is it worth an additional $900? I'll have more to say about the value and other features and why I could not take staring at that logoless chin in this next video. Thank you all so very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.